So first of all, to start with uh, acknowledgement, thanks for the invitation, and also to say that this work was uh, really done as a result of two projects I was involved in. One was the IDEAL project on the developing methods for rare diseases, and the other was the DIAMOND project at uh, Sheffield uh, University, which is specifically about using N of 1 trials uh, to uh, help patient decisions. So what I hope to do with this course is the following, is um, uh, introduce you to the topic and convince you it's interesting and perhaps even useful, that's lecture one. Uh, in lecture two, develop randomization-based approaches. In lecture three, develop mixed model-based approaches. And in lecture four, cover analysis of binary data and also some planning issues. And the point is that the main difference between lecture two and three is to do with purposes, reasons as to why we should want to carry out N of 1 trials. And that has an influence on the way in which we regard the uh, random element as having arisen and also what we do with it. And overall, I want to convince you that carefully thinking about purpose is important. What I'm not going to cover is the following. I'm not going to cover practical aspects of running and reporting N of 1 trials but that doesn't mean they're not important. They're covered in great detail in the Diamond Report, and there is a link there to the Diamond Report, report uh, if you want to download it. And on the right-hand side of the screen, which I'm not going to go through either, uh, are the various sections of the Diamond Report, and that tells you what you can expect to find in it. So what I hope to do in this lecture is define end of one trials, give you some history of their use, perhaps as a motivation, and also to explain why we are where we are, explain what they can be used for, and give some background regarding different purposes, which I shall pick up again in lecture two and in the rest of the course. So three quotes to start with. No man is an island entire in itself. That's by John Donne. And then another one, there are probably no two men in existence on whom the drug acts in exactly the same manner. This is from Wilkie Collins's Victorian thriller, The Moonstone. And also from The Moonstone, if we could this year exactly reproduce, in your case, the conditions as they existed last year, it is physiologically certain that we should arrive at exactly the same result. But this, there is no denying it, is simply impossible. Now, the point about the first quote, of course, is to remind us that we are all in this together in the sense that we all share the human experience. And there are many aspects of response to treatment which are not individual, but which are, in fact, to be expected from all of us. Very few of us would survive, if any, would survive high doses of cyanide if given to us, just to give you one example. The uh, second and third quotes by uh, Wilkie Collins remind us of two particularly important things. The second one says that there are probably no two men in existence in whom the drug acts in exactly the same manner. So this, is, if you like, is a pro the idea of individualization, that different people will react differently to different treatments. But then he also reminds us that the same person will react differently to the same treatment. And this is a feature of the plot of a moonstone, which I don't have time to go into, but it's an exciting book, which I can recommend. So an end of one trial is a trial in which a number of episodes of treatment are studied in a single patient, usually with a view to making inferences about the effect of treatment in that patient. That's my definition of it. But we're going to be looking particularly in this course at the idea of combining end of one trials. We may have run more than one end of one trial. Is there any way in which the information can be combined that's useful? But it has to be admitted that historically the emphasis has been on an independent study of effects, but that's not the attitude we're going to have in this particular course. Um, just to warn you, I shall frequently illustrate the use of SAS uh, and R, but I'm not going to use um, SAS and R in the course. Um, uh, as just going to use SAS and R rather. I'm also going to use GenStat. And I mention that because I suspect that um, some of you will be familiar with R, some of you will be familiar with SAS, and probably others will be familiar with Stata, with which I'm completely unfamiliar. Um, but very few of you will be familiar with GenStat, even though Australia has been an area which has uh, a country which has contributed uh, massively to the development of the GenStat package. It's good not to be reliant on one package, in my, in my opinion, but also different packages have different strengths. And GenStat is particularly good at designed experiments. 
But to warn you, I'm not an expert on SaaS. I have uh, used SaaS for real during the eight years I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not an expert on R. I used R when I was lecturing at university, which was the standard teaching package we use for students, but I'm not an expert on it. I can't even claim to be an expert on Genster. So here's a diagram which perhaps shows you what sort of thing one might expect from an end of one trial. If you look at the right, I imagine we've got two patients. Each patient will be treated in three cycles. And with each cycle on different occasions, they will be treated either with treatment A or treatment B. And if you look at patient number one in cycle one, the patient was treated by A in a first period and then in a second episode, rather, treated by uh, treatment B. That same pattern was repeated for the second cycle where uh, B followed A. But in the third cycle, it was the case that A followed B. And the idea is that we could randomize within cycles to particular treatments. The tight control that the cycles offer has some advantages and it also leads to some simplification and analysis. So this is a very common design. There are other designs one could imagine. One could, for example, decide to use all of the six episodes that are here and have a complete random allocation, three versus three throughout them. But this is the particular design that I'm going to talk about. So um, one of the disadvantages uh, for N of one trials, of course, is they're only possible for chronic diseases. We're not in the resurrection business, so we can't bring people back to life if they've died under a particular treatment and say, well, let's see whether you would have done better on the other one. So it's necessary, essentially, that we have a reversible treatment effects. And that makes it only possible for chronic diseases. Um, here, I'm looking at a possible randomization in K cycles of treatments, and that implies two to the power of K possible sequences. But as a warning, there are two very different traditions. The medical tradition has tended to emphasize independent analysis of single patients. There are some early exceptions, but this has been the modern trend. So each time a new patient is studied, you pretend you know nothing at all about the treatment, and you just give them the, the treatment to see uh, in a number of cycles to try and find out which will be best for them. This is not the subject of this course. Statistical, on the other hand, has tended to emphasize simultaneous analysis of results from all patients treated under a common N of one protocol. This is the approach that will be treated, taken in this course. When I say simultaneous, that's perhaps slightly dishonest because of course, to gather together a number of results, we're going to have to treat a number of patients and it's very unlikely that we will be treated simultaneously, but we can form some sort of overall opinion once we've treated them all. So here's an early example. This is from students' famous paper of 1908, The Probable Error of a Mean. And he says, as an instance of the kind of use which may be made of the tables, I take the following figures from a table by A.R. Kushni and A.R. Peoples in the Journal of Physiology for 1904, showing the different effects of the optical isomers of hyoscyamine hydrobromide in producing sleep. The sleep of 10 patients was measured without hypnotic and after treatment, one with dehyocyamine hydrobromide Two, with L-hyocyamine hydrobromide, the average number of hours sleep gained by the use of the drug is tabulated below. The conclusion arrived at was in the usual dose, two was, but one was not of value as a soporific. So here are the data as they appear in students' paper. Uh, you have a difference to control. The values are actually different to some control periods. The hours of sleep gained. So a positive value means that the patient uh, slept better <coughs> under that particular treatment than they did in the control nights. Um, and you've also got the difference between the two treatments in the final column. And then you've got some calculations as a result of them. However, a student made a mistake. There was no dextro form, but a racemate, uh, which is a dextro levo mixture. So the treatments were not quite what he thought. And in any case, he mislabeled the column. The column headed dextro is, in any case, the other molecule that was included. Uh, and if we go back to the original Kushner and Peebles data, I'm not going to go through these in detail, you'll find them here. And you can compare this to what student has. It wasn't until many years later that uh, the error was pointed out to students by an American correspondent. And by that time, the data had already been copied by Fisher in his book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers. So who was the person who organized the clinical trial? Well, this was Arthur Kushney, a leading Scottish pharmacologist born in Fochabers on the Moray Firth uh, in the north of Scotland. He studied medicine at Aberdeen and then worked in Bern with Kronika. 
and uh, Strasberg in Schmiedeberg. These were both uh, famous um, physiologists and pharmac pharmacologists. Now, at the relative young age of 27, he was called to Michigan to be a uh, <coughs> professor of Materia Medica there. And in fact, he stayed at Michigan for um, quite a while before going to UCL, University College London, and then eventually to Edinburgh. And he died at the relatively young age of 60 um, in Peppermill House, a house that he bought in Edinburgh, which you can still see there. Now, he was a pioneer of um, studying optical isomerism, uh, which is something that fascinated him. The fact that uh, drugs which appear to have the same structure if written in two-dimensional form, only if you uh, write them in three-dimensional form can you see a difference, uh, can actually have a different effect on the response of patients. And this led, amongst other things, to the specific receptor form of drug response, because the idea that the chemist then had was that maybe the way that the molecule acts is like a key that fits into a lock. And the key has to be of a particular shape to fit into the lock. So this is the particular trial that they uh, carried out in, uh, in uh, the, Michigan, uh, the Michigan Asylum for Insane at Kalamazoo. Um, the harmlessness of small doses of both alcoholoids were first ascertained in ourselves, and then a number of tablets, each containing 0.6 micrograms of L-hyacine or R-hyacine hydrobromates. And this is probably the origin of student's mistake. He was thinking that L was for left and R was for right, but in actual fact, they're the Latin Levo and also racemate hyacine, and racemate is a mixture. And so what they were doing was they were trying to work out how the right-hand form differed from the left-hand form by comparing a mixture to the left-hand form. Why were they doing this? Because the right-hand form was unstable. You couldn't actually keep it in that particular way, but you could have a mixture of the two. Um, so what they also did was they included another particular treatment to see whether this was uh, beneficial or not. And this is the sort of scheme that they used, something like this. Um, for example, uh, H might be the, uh, H is the other, the other pharmaceutical, R is the racemate, L is the Levo form. The dashes here mean no treatment. So basically between the particular administrations of the drugs, they had uh, days in which the patients were not treated. And then once they'd had a sufficient series like that, they simply went cycle through HRL, 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 that sort of thing. So really all that's missing from modern design is randomization. There's no randomization here. This, by the way, shows a scatter plot of the data as a student would have seen them had he decided to use a scatter plot. And as Kushni and Peebles would have seen them had they decided to use a scatter plot. The blue diamonds are what student imagined the data were. But remember that student had made a mistake. So he's actually comparing the two drugs rather than comparing the racemate to the Levo form. And what Kushni and Peebles would have seen is what you see on with the red squares. And you can see that the red squares cluster about the line of equality. And one can see visually, in fact, looking at this, that there is a difference between the two different drugs. That's what the blue diamond shows you. But there isn't a difference between the uh, red, between the uh, two optical isomers, which is what the red squares showed you. And this is exactly the conclusion that Kushni and Peebles came to. And this is very humbling for any statistician because the situation is the following. The pharmacologists, the life scientists, with no benefit of uh, modern statistics that was being developed at the time, came to the right conclusion. And student, a pioneer of modern statistics, and R.A. Fisher, possibly the most important statistician ever, both came to the wrong conclusion for the reason that they had the wrong data. Is it really student's test? Well, you could argue against it actually, because we also now know that student was anticipated. Uh, as some of you will know, there's a paper by Stephen Stiegler, which he very wittily entitled Stiegler's Law of Eponymy, in which he shows that if something is named after somebody, it was definitely not discovered by them. And he says at the end, aha, you will think that I am the exception to the rule because, um, 
so you will say, well, what about Stiegler's law of eponymy then? That was, that was discovered by Stiegler. And he then shows that, in fact, it was not discovered by Stiegler and it's been discovered before. But everybody does call it Stiegler's law of eponymy. So in actual fact, what he says turns out to be correct. So we now know that students' t-test was not due to student, it's due to Jakob Lort, a German <coughs> astronomer who developed it in 1876. So that is more than 30 years ahead of student. But we could argue that yes, because student derived it himself, because he needed it in his work for the Guinness Company, and he used it. And in actual fact, he also um, prepared limited tables of it, which I'm not sure that Luro did. <coughs> And Fisher then improved it and proved the result in, <coughs> in students' tests rigorously in 1925. But I think one could regard student as being the true original implementer of the t-test at least. And what about the trial at Kalamazoo? Well, it was an innovative investigation, a very interesting scientific hypothesis. Is it the case that one can detect in <coughs> um, their effect as hypnotics a difference between two particular optical isomers of a particular drug in this case, no, but we do know, and the, the uh, physiologists, uh, both Cushney and Peebles, knew that there are different differences that can be detected in optical isomers. They had an intelligent use, clever use of control, a sensible conclusion, and they also prepared the ethical ground. They took um, particular, these particular treatments themselves, first of all, themselves, before applying them to the patients who, being insane asylum uh, inmates, would have had uh, little possibility of really knowing what was happening to them. Only randomization is missing. Um, the design is a series of N one trials, but unfortunately we don't have the original data. I've tried to get hold of the original data. I've done extensive searches, um, uh, writing off letters in the pre-internet um, age to various, uh, <coughs> various authorities. Uh, as a result of which, uh, Bill Richardson and I wrote a paper about this particular T-test, giving you the historical background, but we never managed to get hold of the data and subsequent internet searches by me have also failed to turn them up. The next figure I'm going to cover is Paul Martini. He was born in uh, Frankenthal in Germany and studied medicine in Munich and Kiel. And he became the medical director of St. Hedwig Clinic in Berlin. But one thing he complained about, which is something that anybody who's headed up a stats clinic as I have at UCL for a few years will know themselves, is that there seems to be much more research in diagnosis than there is in therapeutics. Uh, and in fact, this is certainly the case when it comes to student dissertations, perhaps for obvious practical reasons. But you will find that a lot, lot more is done regarding diagnosis than therapeutics. And even with COVID, I think you'll find that um, although a large number of studies were initiated to try and find effective agents, you'll find that an enormous number of attempts to find uh, predictive models have been <coughs> undertaken. I suspect there have been thousands and thousands of papers in that particular area, uh, none of which have really led to anything particularly useful. Um, in his 1932 monograph, Methods of Therapeutic Examination, he advocated careful assessment of treatment, including out of one trials. So the next person to consider is R.A. Fisher. Um, his 1925 book, um, Statistical Methods of Research Workers, became uh, a best-selling classic. I can only be jealous. Um, uh, but his second book perhaps sold less well, but is in many ways uh, even more interesting. And that is the design of experiments, 1935. It was Fisher who was the first person to really realize that experimental design had a lot to do with the science of statistics and that experimental design could become a science in its own right. So um, he uh, introduces in the design of experiment, the famous teeth tasting examples we'll have a look at. Um, and he used randomization to analyze this as designed. So the tea tasting experiment um, was in fact carried out on Muriel Bristol. She was an algologist at Rothamsted. And apparently one day in the, um, as she was queuing for tea, what uh, Fisher did was he poured uh, milk in last at tea time. Uh, and <clears throat> what she really preferred was to have milk poured in first. Um, and uh, somebody standing in the queue, uh, Bill Roach, who was a scientist there, who was later to marry Muriel Bristol, said, uh, why don't we test her? 
So Fisher designed the test and what happened was that she was presented with eight cups um, in a way that she hadn't seen how they'd been prepared, four with milk in first and four with milk in second, and he was then set her to the test. <coughs> so if we look at how the experiment works, it works as follows. There are eight cups in, in total, four with the milk in first and four with the tea in first. The order is randomized, and this is very important. She is told it is randomized. Fisher does not attempt, attempt to improve on the blinding by telling her, by not telling her how the particular experiment is organized, leaving her guessing, is it perhaps the case that there are six with milk in first and two with tea in first and so forth, because he realizes that this is sort of futile, because if she guesses correctly, he doesn't really know what information she's using. She may also have guessed that he would use a four and four allocation and not a six and two allocation. <clears throat> Nowadays, you'll find that uh, trialists are not as wise. Some trialists will tell you you should never tell the physician who's running the trial what the block size is. Um, and to which I say, well, what is the block size? You can tell me. And they say four. And I say, oh, all right, well, that's interesting. And the last time you ran a trial, what was the block size? Oh, it was four. And the time before that, it's four, we always use four, but we don't tell the physician so they can't possibly guess. This is what I call the argument from the stupidity of others. Fisher doesn't use the argument from the stupidity of others. He makes it absolutely clear that the details of the randomization procedure are shared with the subject. And I think informed consent basically involves you as an experimenter, hoping that the subject will understand what you're about to do. Of course, this would ruin a lot of psychology, where psychology often, psychological experiments often involve deliberate deception, but I wonder how long the psychologists will continue to be allowed to get away with that particular strategy, but that's another talk. So her task is to guess which cups are which. And Fisher calculates as follows. The total number of sequences is eight factorial divided by four factorial, four factorial. In other words, eight choose four, and that's 70. So a possibility of guessing all cups correctly if she cannot tell the difference is one upon 70. So he's using a randomization argument. Now, if we go on to N of 1 trials more generally, they were early, early used in psychology by uh, Skinner. And Sidman wrote a book in 1960, which I have heard of, but have not managed to get hold of a copy to see. And then in 1980s, the McMaster group, uh, many of you will know that McMaster in Canada was a university or continues to be a university that was a pioneer in uh, introducing ideas of evidence-based medicine. And Gordon Guy et al. report their use of them in a 1986 article in New England Journal of Medicine. And by the end of the 1980s, McMaster Group had run 57 such trials, which means they had actually tried them out in 57 patients. Each patient was referred to as a trial. They're not talking about groups of uh, N of 1 trials, as we shall be in this particular course. And this is uh, a quote from uh, <coughs> a subsequent review article about this. The department was multidisciplinary and very tightly integrated. So there were statisticians and psychologists and people with behavioral background, physicians and epidemiologists getting together on a regular basis. And for a while, one of the psychologists would say, oh, that'd be very interesting for an end of one trial. And we said, thank you very much, and would go on. Then at one point it clicked and we started to get out the psychology literature and found three textbooks full of end of one designs from a psychology perspective. It was totally old news. <clears throat> Since 1990, paper, papers on end of one trials have begun to trickle into the literature. But generally, there's little serious work in these papers in terms of methodology. There are some exceptions. There's a paper by Rochon 1990, which uses time series measurements for individual patients. That's when you have a very long series of measurements that you can take. And sets of on, N of one trials where the work of Deborah Zucker and colleagues in particular is important. They describe using Bayesian methods, although one could actually say they're simply random effect model methods for analyzing sets of N of one trials. Um, it's equivalent to using mixed models. And the paper that we're also going to have a look at in some detail on the course is, or at least look at some of the recommendations, is the Chen and Chen one from 2014 in PLOS one. Uh, an interesting uh, early, uh, Implementation of series of N of 1 trials was by uh, Erwig et al. in the British Medical Journal in 1994. I should declare an interest here 
Um, diclofenac is one of the treatments being compared. Diclofenac is sold as Voltaren or Voltarol, depending on where in the world you are, by Ciba Geigy. A uh, forerunner company, Novartis. Uh, Ciba Geigy is a company I used to work for, and Novartis is a company I have frequently done um, consulting for. So obviously, I have an interest in diclofenac. Um, and they each randomized in three four week cycles. In each four week cycle, paracetamol was given for two weeks, diclofenac for two weeks, with the order being random. So, this is exactly the sort of design we had a look at in the tree diagram at the very beginning. The most severely affected joint was used for assessment, and the first week of every two week treatment was discarded to avoid carryover. This is a very uh, sensible and uh, <coughs> good uh, choice to make. Uh, it's what I call an active washout. You actually don't use the measurements in the first period because they could be affected by treatment, the first part of a particular treatment period because it could be affected by the previous treatment. The results were compared using a T-test with two degrees of freedom. Three pairs per patient yield three differences and hence two degrees of freedom. Uh, and these are the results here. And the conclusions are uh, the... Uh, in osteoarthritis, many patients currently receiving or being considered for non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory drugs may achieve adequate control with paracetamol. However, each T-test only has two degrees of freedom. Um, so that means that the variance estimates are extremely unstable. So you could say, would a pooled variance be better? We'll have a look at this later. The default is taking you paracetamol. The clofenac has to prove itself to be better, but why not have the reverse test also? Uh, in other words, uh, evidence, uh, absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. And no attempt is made to analyze the results as a whole. So it could be used perhaps match pairs T using summaries or a meta-analysis. If we do that, if we reduce everything to a mean per patient, then given the number of patients that are involved, <clears throat> then in that case, we can carry out a uh, one sample T-test using the mean differences for the patients, 16 patients. And if we do that, then we get a p-value, which is just below the magical 0.05. So maybe we could say, well, that's all very well, but on average, uh, diclofenac seems to be better than uh, paracetamol. So how is this possible if hardly any patients would be better off taking diclofenac than paracetamol? Uh, or we could carry out a meta-analysis using, uh, here I've done, I've pulled the variance to make sure that the variance estimate is the same for each particular subject. These are the, this is the forest plot for meta-analysis. You can see that there's clear evidence of heterogeneity. It does look in fact as if patients 11 and patients 14 seem to be quite different from, from the others. But for the rest, it's less obvious that you've got uh, a different pattern. The blue uh, triangle is uh, the fixed effect analysis. The red nablus, using nablus for a downward pointing triangle, is, um, is a random effects meta-analysis with the whiskers being the confidence intervals. And the latter, in fact, is what essentially the t-test that we used was giving us. So why do we do N of one trials? To increase efficiency, the between patient main effect variation is eliminated. Increasing the number of times we study individual patients reduces the within patient variance as well. And studying more ep episodes within patients is an alternative to studying more patients. And since I was working on a rare diseases project, the ideal project headed by Dieter Hilgers at the University of Aachen, this was a particularly attractive path to go down. If you have a limited number of patients suffering from a particular disease, which is chronic, then perhaps one way to try and find out what is best for this particular community of patients is to study each patient several times. But there's another possibility, and that's given on the right-hand side, to identify components of variation. By repeatedly studying the same patient while varying the treatment, we can estimate various sources of variation between patient, within patient, and treatment with patient interaction. And this is explained in the next few slides. <clears throat> About rare diseases, by the way, um, these are some, some uh, definitions that you'll find according to which particular 
authority you look at, but the key message is that although uh, a rare disease, of course, means that few patients suffer from a given disease, there are actually rather a lot of rare diseases. So the paradox here is that the number of patients suffering from a rare disease is not that small, even though the number of patients suffering from any rare disease is, of course, a necessity because the definition is small. Identifying components of variation, little has been done about that, in fact. You'll find that this is a neglected aspect of N of 1 trials, although recently people have been trying to do this <coughs> um, more systematically. Here is an example however, from some years ago in an area in which I consider it's probably implausible that there will be much independent variation. And this is from a bioequivalent study, so a study in which a brand name and a generic drug are being compared in healthy volunteers. And each healthy volunteer in this particular trial, in a first pair of periods, received either <coughs> um, the brand name or the generic in random order, and the order was then switched for the second pair of periods. So what that meant was that you could actually compare twice the brand name and the generic subject by subject. And the particular scatter plot here shows you what the relative area under the concentration curve is subject by subject. And the interesting thing here is that there is essentially no correlation, or at least there's a negative correlation, which presumably is just a chance finding. <clears throat> so it's useless trying to predict what somebody's relative concentration will be in the second pair of periods using their relative concentration in the first pair of periods. You'd be better off just using the overall average. <clears throat> This is a thing that many people find counterintuitive, but the point is that they're overlooking the fact that there can be considerable variation from day to day. And if you've ever had your blood pressure measured, um, uh, you will find that, uh, repeatedly measured, you will find that the measurements frequently vary. And that's a thing that people tend to overlook when interpreting results. So this is uh, just to underline the um, sources of variation in clinical trials, uh, label A, between treatments. Uh, this is the difference between treatments, average overall patients. This is essentially why we enter clinical trials and want to try and find out what the difference is. Between patients, this is the fact that the same, the different patients given the same treatment would vary over time, what one might call the main effect of patient in the statistical jargon. C, treatment by patient interaction, the extent to which the effect of treatment varies from patient to patient. This is essentially what personalized medicine is all about. And a lot of the hype surrounding personalized medicine has been because people have overestimated the importance of this particular component. They assume everything that they see is treatment by patient interaction. In many cases, we simply don't know. And D is the one that people tend to forget. This is within patient variation. And this is the extent to which the results vary from occasion to occasion for patients given the same treatment. And can you identify them in clinical trials? Well, not in the standard clinical trial, a parallel group trial, B and C and D are simply lumped together in the error term. People then make uh, <clears throat> stupid choices for analysis. They hand out medals at the end of the trial, responder, non-responder, and they assume that this actually has a causal meaning. It does not. The fact that you've labeled a patient a responder does not mean that they have benefited necessarily from the treatment. You don't know that. <clears throat> uh, in a crossover trial, each patient receives each treatment in one period only. That means that you can actually identify not only the treatment effect, but the between patient variance, but the error term will consist of two things. C, the interaction, and D, the within patient variance. If you have a series of N of 1 trials or repeated crossovers, and each patient receives each treatment in at least two periods, then in fact, A, B, and C become identifiable, and D, the within patient variability, becomes your residual error. This particular diagram is supposed to explain why you should not overinterpret clinical trials. On the left-hand side, what I have is I've got a particular outcome value on some scale, which needn't concern us. And I've got patient as a pseudo dimension on the y-axis. And I've imagined that it would be possible for me to actually study on the same occasion, 
under identical conditions, the same patient using placebo or active. Of course, this is impossible. That's why it's a counterfactual experiment. One of the observations would have to be counterfactual. But what you can see is that in each case, the patient's counterfactual red value, which is the active treatment value, is above their blue value, which is the placebo value. Of course, this is a simulation. I'm the god of this universe, and I've simulated this to be the case. But on the right-hand side, I've actually done <clears throat> what you could do. What I've said to the computer is randomly remove one of the values for each patient. That value then becomes the counterfactual value, the value we don't see. And let's see what the resulting pattern looks like. And now what you will see is that the blue circles and the red squares are mixed together. And we cannot see what we could see on the left-hand side, namely that every single patient has benefited from the treatment here, high values are good. We simply see them mixed together and we then make the stupid <coughs> conclusion that therefore the treatment doesn't be benefit all patients. The answer is we don't know because we don't know what would have happened. This is a quote from uh, Lippmann, who was a famous Luxembourg a mathematician, which is why I sort of rather like it. Tout le monde y croit cependant, me disait un jour Monsieur Lippmann, car les expérimenteurs s'imaginent que c'est un théorème de mathématiques et les mathématiciens que c'est un fait expérimental. Everybody believes in it, said Mr. Lippmann to me one day, because the experimenters imagine it's a theorem of mathematics and the mathematicians did an experimental fact. This was Henri Poincaré quoting Lippmann on the subject of the normal distribution in which perhaps he didn't believe too much himself. And on individual response, this is what I say, the trialists think genetics show it to be inevitable and the geneticists think the trialists have demonstrated it as a fact. So I tend to think that a lot of the hype around in personalized medicine is simply because geneticists don't understand clinical trials and I <clears throat> hold my hand up and say I'm guilty, uh, I don't understand genetics, and we're talking past each other. So here's a thought experiment to show what we could do. Imagine a crossover trial in hypertension. Patients are randomized to receive ACE2 inhibitor or placebo in random order, then we do it again. Each patient does the crossover twice. We compare each patient's response under ACE2 to placebo twice. So this is what the design would be like. We're gonna use four sequences. Shoemaker and Metzler simply reversed the previous sequence in what they did, so they only had two sequences. But I'm going to be a little bit more randomization friendly. And this is what we might see. Here we've got the two uh, treatment estimates for each patient, the second one plotted against the first. Uh, the blue are those that didn't respond using some arbitrary threshold <coughs> on both occasions. The red are those that did respond on both occasions. Uh, and sorry, the blue, I think, are the ones who did respond on both occasions, the red who didn't respond on, uh, on both occasions, and the orange who responded on one occasion or, an, or another. On the right-hand side, we also have what we might see. And the point here is that the two scatter plots are quite different. The left-hand one shows there is a scope of personalized medicine. The right-hand one shows that there is no scope of personalized medicine. But if you have a look at the marginal distributions, in particular, the marginal distribution at the bottom of the diagram, which is that for the first crossover, which is what you would see if you'd only run one crossover. You cannot tell simply from looking at these marginal distributions, which of the two scatter plots would be the case. Only repeating the treatment, both treatments, enables you to do that. So here are some possible objectives of an analysis. Is one of the treatments better? What can be said about the average effect in the patients that were studied? What can be said about the average effect in future patients? What can be said about the effect of a given patient in the trial? What can be said about a future patient not in the trial? And we'll have a look at some of these in due course. So just to sum up, <clears throat> end of one trials have a rather checkered history. Much of the development has been driven by medics and the statistical techniques used have often been naive. There are two important uses to which end of one trials can be put, increasing efficiency and personalizing treatment. These purposes frequently require different analyses. <clears throat> Explaining what is appropriate when is one of the major objectives of this course. And I'm sorry that there isn't time to have um, a discussion now, and I'm sorry that that's been a gallop through, but that's essentially the problem of the constraint, and the constraint is partly a function of my being here in Scotland, you being in Australia. 
There will now be a five minute break and then we will start with lecture number two. Thanks very much, Stephen. We'll be back in five. So what I hope to do in this lecture is uh, give you a reminder of some purposes of clinical trials. That's what we finished with the last lecture. Discuss the randomization theory, the Rothamed school uh, approach and analysis of variance, and then specific to end of one trials, show how these dictate essentially or guide how we should do analysis. Background. So this is not necessarily uh, anything to do with any one trials. So here are some particular questions that we might be interested in. Um, is one of the treatments better? That uh, is something we try to address a significance test, perhaps. What can be said about the average effect in the patients that were studied? We would use estimates and confidence intervals for that. What can be said about the average effects in future patients? That's getting rather more ambitious. What can be said about the effect of a given patient in the trial? And what can be said about a future patient not in the trial? These are all different questions and they actually require different analyses. There are also two different philosophies that we can have in clinical trials. The first one on the left-hand side is the uh, randomization philosophy. The patients in a clinical trial are taken as fixed. Um, and the population is the population of all possible randomizations. And we'd like to know what answer we would get if we could go through all the possible randomizations, because if we could go through all the possible randomizations, then every patient would have had both treatments, although, of course, that's impossible in a power group trial. <clears throat> the patients don't change, only the pattern of assignments of treatments change. And the theory of non-parametric tests and permutation tests is very closely aligned to this particular randomization philosophy. Then we have the sampling philosophy. The patients are regarded as a sample for some possible population of patients. But this is a pro an area that's rather controversial. This is not the target population. It's not necessarily the population of disease patients. We haven't got a simple random sample of those, of all the patients in the disease. But it's some theoretical superpopulation. This is usually handled by adding error terms corresponding to various components of variance, and this approach is much more common. And this is the sort of approach that mixed met models essentially is about. So in this lecture, I'm gonna look at the first of these purposes. Uh, the further questions require mixed models and they'll be dealt with in lecture three. So is one of the treatments better, um, in particular associated with significance tests, analysis of variance and this sort of thing, and leading statisticians involved with this, by the way, you may find a slight difference between a uh, lecture that notes the slides I'm using here and what had been circulated previously, if you had any that had been circulated previously. Um, <clears throat> uh, leading statisticians such as Fisher himself and Frank Yates and uh, John Nelder, Rosemary Bailey, uh, and also Roger Payne, um, as regards the com computational um, development, have been very important for this. And analysis of variance has developed not so much in terms of linear models, but in terms of symmetry. Uh, and a high point is probably John Nelder's paper of, on general balance, or two papers from 1965. So what was general balance? Uh, essentially, the idea is the following. You establish a null analysis of variance, first of all. You think about what variation you would see in the particular set of experimental units that you've got, which may be quite complex in agriculture. <clears throat> um, for example, subplots within plots and plots within fields and all sorts of things like that. And you then establish the treatment structure and you then try and see what difference treatment has made to the underlying variation. And giving randomization, the analysis then follows automatically. So the basic idea is that the uh, variation is split into two radically different components. The block structure, which describes the way that the experimental units are organized and um, the way that variation among units can be described prior to any treatment being allocated in the treatment structure. And most packages don't do this. And as far as I'm aware, the only one that does it formally is GenStat. So together with a third piece of information with the design matrix, these determine the analysis of variance. <clears throat> Note, how, however, the design matrix on its own is not enough. And this is because block and treatment structure can be hierarchical and the computer doesn't know this. 
Uh, and so a design matrix on its own is not sufficient to derive an ANOVA. You can't just point the design matrix at the computer and say, right, go ahead and do the analysis of variance. It needs to know a little bit more. And this little bit more is provided by the division between block and treatment structure and the way in which they're defined. And this approach is incorporated in GenStat. <coughs> in connection with this, the Wilkinson and Rogers notation was uh, developed. By the way, Wilkinson was an Australian statistician. He came to uh, Rothamsted for a while uh, to work with John Nelder, but John Nelder had earlier gone out to work with him in Australia. And this has common notation. Uh, for example, here I'm assuming that A is a main effect of factor A and B a main effect of B. And A dot B is interaction. Note, by the way, that in R you don't have interactions like that because R allows dot to be part of a name. In GenStat, dot is not part of a name of a variable. So different packages, because of where they started, had to have different, uh, different um, conventions. A plus sign is used to add effects, a minus sign used to subtract them. An asterisk um, is used to indicate the main effects and the interactions. So A asterisk B is A plus B plus A dot B. And um, nesting is uh, indicated by uh, A slash B. And this is equivalent to A plus the interaction of B dot A. This is what you do when, in fact, the particular factor is nested. It only has a, a context or a sense within the higher factor. <clears throat> um, this is Wilkinson and Roger notation in three packages. I'm going to skip this, but this just shows you how they're handled differently in R, GenStat, and SAS. I'll give you a specific application instead. So a paper I mentioned before is that by Chen and Chen, 2014 in plus one. And they carried out various analyses and they use this particular design I'm going to be using, which is um, pairs of treatments allocated in cycles. Um, but amongst various approaches that they investigated was the match pairs design where pair was defined by a cycle. So they analyzed each pair within a cycle as independent, although some of the pairs will be in the same patient and some of the pairs will be in different patients. And my initial reaction on seeing this was that it was wrong. And so I then had a look at it with the Rothamsted approach and it turned out it wasn't wrong. And then I realized why it wasn't wrong. So when I got to have a look at this. So this is the same sort of diagram we've seen before. And I'm going to use this particular design, three cycles, two treatments within each pair of episodes within the cycles, but not two patients as shown in the diagram, but 12 patients. And I'm just going to assume there's adequate washout, so I don't need to worry about that. So in actual fact, what I've got is I've got 12 patients times three cycles, times two episodes of treatment, either with A or with B, within each cycle. So I'm going to get 72 observations altogether. I'm going to assume it's an atma, and that efficacy is measured using force expiratory volume in one second in milliliters. And the question is, how should we analyze such an experiment? The data themselves are generated from quite a complicated model. So in the simulation that I did, I had to allow for random main effects of patients, random effects of cycles within patients, pure within cycle occasion to occasion error, an overall effect of treatment and a treatment by patient interaction. It's not all relevant because once one, two and three have been used to generate the values, a random treatment allocator randomly assigns an additional value to each of the 72 block and plot results. Um, <clears throat> One approach to analysis accepts the first part as given and relevant, irrelevant, and then analyses using the randomization framework. So these are the data. Um, the values with four digits, two, three, nine, four, two, six, eight, six, and so forth, are results in milliliters of uh, force expiratory volume in one second. Uh, obviously, they're ridiculously precise. In practice, you wouldn't measure to that number of, number of digits, but it's just to um, reflect the simulation, if you like. Um, and then what you also have is you have for each patient the order that A and B were given within the particular cycle. 
So if you look at patient number one, you will see that patient had A with a one underneath and B with a two underneath. So in that particular cycle, A came first and B came second. In the second cycle, you'll find a three and a four. So A was given first and B was given second. However, in the third cycle, you'll find a six and a five. So in fact, B was given first in period five, the second episode within the cycle. And A was given second in period six, the, sorry, period five, the first episode within the cycle, and then period six, the second episode within the cycle. The underlying values are values that I will assume are missing for the purpose of certain analyses, simply to make the example more complicated and more interesting. And these data uh, are discussed in a paper together with Arta Araujo, a student of mine, and Stephen Julius, professor at Sheffield University. This is a particular way that you can represent the data using a trellis plot. Um, the black line, uh, the black diagonal is a line of equality. The blue dots are the results for the individual cycle. So we're plotting the result for treatment B against that for treatment A. If a dot lies above and to the left of the line equality, line of equality, it shows that B was observed to be better than A in that particular cycle. The red asterisk represents the mean for that particular patient. And I think you can see already from this particular uh, plot here that it seems clear that there is a beneficial effect of B. High values of FEV1 are better than low values of FEV1, and the values for treatment B on the whole are higher than for treatment A. There are one or two blue dots which are to the right and below the line of equality, but not very many. And if we take the averages, which are represented by the red asterisks, those are the average of the three per patient, then I think none of the asterisks are actually to the right and below the line of equality. This, by the way, was not a surprise to me since I'd fed this particular advantage of B, of course, into the simulation when I simulated. This is what some R code looks like. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, this is a trellis plot using R. I'm not particularly expert at R and I couldn't get the asterisks in. So there's a challenge for you there. I'm sure there are many of you who are much better at programming in R than I am. How does the Rothamsted School approach work? The block structure, it says the box structure there. Oh, this is going to annoy me. Sorry, I have to correct this because otherwise it survives from one version to another. The block structure of the experiment is established. This is cycles within patients. So we have patient slash cycle. The treatment structure is established. This is simply treatment. It's not complicated. The outcome variable is declared. And given the design matrix, the analysis now follows. This is fully implemented in GenStat. By the way, <clears throat> there are a series of uh, GenStat macros which have been written for this, and Roger Payne has kindly taken them and improved them, so they should be quite good in due course. But, but here I'm just showing you what an actual program would be like. So the block structure statement says that cycles within patient is the way in which the treatments are organized. The treatment structure is just called treatment. That's a factor with two levels. The levels are A and B. And then I say ANOVA and Y is the outcome. The stuff in square brackets are just options you can ignore. And this is what the analysis of variance looks like here. Um, the variance ratio is what's sometimes called the F statistic and it's 50.57. Uh, the P value is less than 0 0.001. That's the F probability. Um, and <clears throat> If you want estimates of the parameters, which are far more interesting than these sums of squares, then in that case, it tells you that the effect of treatment B compared to treatment A is a benefit of 189 milliliters with a standard error of 26.5, and the T-statistic is 7.11, so really pretty much off the scale. This is the same thing in R. <clears throat> I'll leave you to have a look at that yourself. Result is exactly the same, no big mystery there. But 
What about the match pairs approach? We don't analyze the original data. Instead, we reduce everything to a difference between pairs. <clears throat> In this case, pair is defined by patient and cycle within patient. And there are thus 12 times three equals 36 pairs in total. Remember, this is the analysis that was covered in Chen and Chen. This is the analysis which I said when I first looked at it, I thought, no, this can't be right. Treating these 36 values as being independent. <clears throat> so here, what I've done is I've simply calculated these differences and I've included them in a dot plot. Here, the, um, the, uh, the y-axis is the occasion uh, cycle one, two, or three. And the uh, x-axis is the difference between B and A, B minus A. And these are the results per patient. And what I've done is I've calculated a match pairs T using cycles to define pair. You can see that the, uh, <coughs> sorry, the headers are missing here, but the sample size should be 36. The mean is 187 and so forth. So they're not aligned. Uh, and what you get is you get a T statistic, which is 7.11 on 35 degrees of freedom. If I square this T statistic, I get 50.57. Fifty point five seven is exactly the value I got before using the analysis of variance using the Rotham set approach. So, what are the consequences? The consequences are that the match pairs t test examined by Chen and Chen in two thousand and fourteen is, much to my surprise, a valid analysis. But there is a sting in the tail. One has to think very carefully about the circumstances under which it is valid. It's justified by the randomization theory of the Rotham says school and by John Nelder's approach. But you have to be very careful. It's a valid analysis for testing a specific null. And the null hypothesis it tests is the following. The two treatments are identical for every patient. In other words, there is no patient in which the treatments are not the same. Now, you may say, well, that's particularly naive, but actually it's not necessarily unreasonable. If we were doing a proof of concept, we might actually try to treat a single patient and treat them many, many times to see if the treatment works at all. If that particular patient gets rather impatient with our incessant testing of them, we might decide that we want some more patients and so on and so forth. And basically all we're saying is that there has to be at least one patient for whom the effect is not zero, for us to consider that there is something worth investigating. The null hypothesis is that there isn't such a patient and that therefore implies that the interaction is zero. So this, this, in, this particular analysis is in fact true, provided we make the assumption that the interaction is zero and that assumption is part of the null hypothesis. And so that is perfectly reasonable. That doesn't mean that it's reasonable for all analyses, for all purposes rather. There are other purposes for which this analysis would not be reasonable. However, it also raises the question, can we do better? Well, the answer is yes. We can go one step further and remove the treatment by patient interaction from the residual sum of squares. Uh, under the null hypothesis, the expected value of the interaction is no different from the residual. But if the alternative is true, then in that case, we end up using a smaller residual sum of squares. And this is analogous to the following idea when carrying out a two sample t test. In the two sample t test, the null hypothesis says that the two treatments are the same. If the two treatments are the same, why do we estimate the variance separately within each treatment group? We lose one degree of freedom by doing that. The reason we do that is not because under the null hypothesis, the variance estimate will be invalid. It's because under the alternative hypothesis, the variance estimate will be larger than it needs to be because we can remove the difference between treatments from the variance estimate. So essentially, the justification for the way in which we run the two sample T is because we're thinking about the alternative hypothesis. And the same is true here. Although we're assuming that the interaction is zero under the null hypothesis, it doesn't have to be zero under the alternative hypothesis so we could actually remove it. And we can do that in an analysis of variance as follows. We can add the patient by treatment interaction term. 
and we get a slightly different variance ratio now, 54.13. And there's an analogy, in fact, to a fixed effect meta-analysis. The total degrees of freedom that we have for error are as given in the table on the right. We have, in fact, got n minus 1 for patient, because that's patient is a factor with, uh, in this case, 12 levels, so we have 11 degrees of freedom. Cycle by patient, there are n patients, but we're going to lose one degree of freedom within patient for each cycle, so that's nk minus 1. Treatment 1, treatment by patient n minus 1, residual nk minus 1. I'll leave you to do the algebra. In fact, we end up with 2nk minus 1. And in this particular case, the residual is 24. But this gives us exactly the same total as if we had uh, a fixed effect meta-analysis provided we call the variance estimate. Um, I won't go through the demonstration of that, but you can check for yourself and this is a point that's often overlooked. People sometimes say that the difference between a fixed effect and a random effect to meta-analysis is whether there is a trial by treatment interaction. This is not correct. Both methods allow for there being a trial by treatment interaction. It's just that one method doesn't consider it has to contribute to the variability of the treatment effect because of the purpose. The purpose is to find whether the treatment was effective in at least one trial. The random effect meta-analysis, on the other hand, tries to determine whether the treatment is likely to be effective in general across trials. So a fixed effect meta-analysis recipe is as follows. Calculate the difference B minus A for each patient. Calculate the mean difference for each patient I as an estimate of the treatment effect delta I. Calculate the degrees of freedom for each patient in the balanced case, these equal k minus one. More generally, we have k, k sub i minus one. Calculate the correct to sum of squares for the difference for each patient. Sum the correct to sum of squares over all patients. Divide this sum by the total degrees of freedom to obtain an estimate of the variance. And for each patient, produce an estimate of the variance using the pooled sigma hat squared, but dividing by the local number of observations, which is k sub i. So the variance will only differ according to the number of cycles you observed a patient for. In the example so far, each patient has been observed for three cycles, so it doesn't matter. But you are not differing according to the variance. You're using a pool variance. The reason you're doing this is the degrees of freedom are so small. Now, you may say this is an outrageous thing to do, but it's very common in analysis of variance. If you're used to doing post hoc tests in analysis of variance, you use the pooled variance. Use the estimates of the treatment effect and their variance as input to a fixed meta-analysis routine. So here is an example of the sort of thing that one might do. Uh, I have got my estimates for each patient. Each patient, these theta i, are the uh, mean of the three differences B minus A for each patient. The standard errors are all the same. Why are the standard errors all the same? They're all the same because I'm using a pooled estimate of the variance and because every patient has three observations. And so what I get is I get simply a trivial case where the weights will be all equal in any case. And I plug this into a meta-analysis routine as I have done here and it gives me this particular fixed effect meta-analysis result. And in fact, this is equivalent to the analysis of variance I did before removing the interaction. And that's what it looks like. But the consequences are, the practical one is it gives us an approach to exploiting the very many meta-analysis routines that there are in various packages to analyzing and presenting sets of N of 1 trials. And whether or not you followed all of that, which was very quick and somewhat garbled, this is the take home message that is important. With a little bit of ingenuity, you can very easily adapt the very many powerful routines you have in meta analysis in whichever particular statistical <coughs> language you prefer. There are many powerful packages within R, for example. I'm sure there are many things available for you in Stata as well. Uh, and in SAS, <coughs> there are macros as well. Um, and in GenStat, there's a routine and so forth. So you can use those 
in order to do the analysis. However, one particular proviso, you need to make sure that you use a pooled variance estimate. In other words, in a first step, before you call out the meta-analysis routine, you make sure you've calculated these standard errors based on the pooled variance. <clears throat> but the theoretical consequence is it shows a justification more generally for fixed effect meta-analysis as a valid approach to testing whether a treatment can be effective. There's a very interesting parallel here and it casts a lot of light and insight on the subject of meta-analysis. But it also suggests to us, which we've been having a look at in lecture three uh, in a fortnight's time, exploring the random effects meta-analysis approach as a means of answering some of the other questions that might arise with analysis of N1 trials. So just anticipating a bit, this is what happens if what I do is I apply a uh, random effect meta-analysis approach and a fixed effect meta-analysis. Here, the treatment by subject interaction is very, very small. So there's almost no difference to the confidence intervals. The point estimate is exactly the same, or it ought to be the same, because in actual fact, the uh, variances are all the same. Just to underline that again, in a conventional meta-analysis, the variance would be estimated independently within each trial. This is a really bad idea for N of one trials. The, the, the random difference that you'll see from patient to patient in variances is huge, and it really completely outweighs any systematic differences that you're likely to see. So it's better to use a pool variance. <clears throat> um, this plot, for example, shows you the probability of a variance ratio of at least 10 to one as a function of the number of trials depending on how many degrees of freedom you have. Degrees of freedom equals two is a situation that corresponds to three cycles, which is what we've been considering already. So as soon as you have something like five, <coughs> five patients, uh, you can expect that uh, the probability that the variance will differ randomly between the highest case and the lowest variance by a factor of more than 10 to one is greater than one half. So you're going to see huge random variation. Some practical advice, this general fixed effects approach is appropriate if either of these is the case. You're trying to prove the treatment can work or you're interested in the mean effect in the patients actually studied and you can exploit standard meta-analysis software to do this, but I get underline again, you must use the pooled variance estimate. You'll go all over the place otherwise. Right, so I got through that faster than I expected. <clears throat> it's probably not a good idea. And we do have some time for questions after all. Thank you very much, Stephen. Some very interesting, great presentations there. And I hope you've all learned as much as I have. Um, does anyone have any questions for Stephen while we've got him online? Blown them all away, Stephen. Either that or it's too late in the evening over here and everyone's hungry. <laughs> well, I can imagine you've got other things that you, that you want to do. Um, so just to, just to say that um, it's anybody who's <clears throat> reasonably ambitious, I'm sure will succeed in uh, implementing the analyses that I've shown on their favorite meta-analysis package if they're used to doing it. So they can check to see whether I'm right or wrong. Maybe that can be everyone's homework before the uh, <laughs> next webinar. Yes. <laughs> I hope I don't get some nasty surprises between now <laughs> and the next <laughs> fortnight. But yes, that, that, will, that will be a good thing, a good thing to do. Um, I think also, I don't know what I've done. I thought I was going to go through. Have I got? Kate, there's a question in the chat from Teresa. Oh, is there? I missed that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Teresa Neiman says, how about a shrinkage estimate for each individual variance rather than a pooled? Ah, that is a very interesting idea. Yes, you could have a shrinkage estimate. Um, that would be the ideal compromise between using um, an independent estimate or using a, um, or using a pooled estimate. Um, 
I'm not sure that they will, you will get that much traction. You might do. I think the problem with all of these things is you need to have a reasonable number of degrees of freedom. If you've got a large number of patients, it might be worth doing. Yeah. I think otherwise the shrinkage itself. Um, in, a, um, in a paper that I published a few years ago in pharmaceutical statistics, no, I think maybe in statistical medicine, medical research, I'm not sure. I looked at the business of planning N of one trials. And there I looked at uh, how many patients you had to have studied to shrink the treatment estimates themselves, which in fact is something um, one would like to do really reliably. In other words, um, there's a component of variance that you want to estimate, which is the interactive one. And it turned out to be a rather disappointingly high number. Um, plausibly, you needed to have something like 100 patients to be able to shrink the, the treatment effects really reliably. That's not, that's not to say it's not worth doing anyway, even when you have a few patients, that's a rather different issue. Um, but it does show that you have to be rather careful. I suspect, but I must confess I haven't studied it, that shrinking the variances would require even more information, but I don't know. But do you have some experience yourself? Teresa, do you want to answer yourself? She's put it in the chat. Yeah, no, I, I guess I'm just saying this because, uh, you know, in, when we do a, a differential expression um, analysis, where we have 30,000 ah, yes. 30, yeah. genes, yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, and we're yeah. basically doing a whole lot of t-tests, and, and then there's a question that we, we don't pull variances, right? Because... Um, yeah, that, that's that, that absolutely correct. I should have given that as an example. That's a, that's a brilliant example to use. But there you have a lot of information for the shrinkage. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yes, uh, and of course it's uh, it's uh, <clears throat> absolutely reasonable to do that. It's interesting um, if you look at the development of analysis of variance um, in Rotham said there there of course uh, Fisher typically pooled the variances all over the design, but often all you had was 12 residual degrees of freedom anyway for the whole of a design because the agricultural scientists were so ambitious about all the things that they were studying in one field in one season that um, you know comparing uh, four treatments and you had you were also eliminating uh, four columns and uh, four, five columns five rows and five treatments in a typical five by five latin square you had 12 degrees of freedom left then there really was no way you can make any progress unless you pooled Mm -hmm. straight off but shrinkage is the is the compromise i agree but maybe more more feasible for gene expression than for n of one trials i mean i figured you were going to be going in that direction when when you're asking the question about um what is an individual patient's response that that would be a, a shrinkage <clears throat> yes uh, what i find but maybe you can comment here what i find about slightly baffling is considering that they're so used to shrinkage which is very very sensible all the people doing this fantastic in vitro work, why are they so convinced that in clinical trials, we know that patients respond differently? How do they imagine we do this? You know, but ba basically they're, they're, they're using huge amounts of information and they're using really mega, mega shrinkage. And yet when it comes to clinical trials, they think, oh, we can, you know, this one responded, that one didn't respond to this one responded, baffling. It's yeah. a complete contradiction between the two worlds. Yeah, it's true. We don't, yeah, we, it's true in clinical trials, we don't think that way. We, and we, uh, that's also true with centers, right? We always report center results. We never think about Yeah, I mean, that, in my opinion, it's a complete waste of time, yeah. <laughs> usually, um, because um, we, we, don't, we don't really have the information that would enable us to, uh, to say to facing by centers. I mean, there are occasions where, I have a blog up where I showed that there's a very interesting book by uh, uh, Caroline Criado Perez, um, Invisible Women, about how um, women are neglected by uh, data collection systems, uh, with much of which I agree. It's a uh, it's, it's very well argued book, and I, I would um, recommend that, that people read it. However, uh, she discusses bioequivalence studies, and she gets this absolutely completely wrong. Um, she assumes that there is strong evidence that uh, bioequivalence will differ in, in uh, women and men, and this is simply not true. Uh, there's hardly any evidence of this at all. Um, there's evidence that the uh, concentration in the blood will differ between women and men, that is absolutely true, but that the ratio 
a generic to brand name would differ between women and men. There is very, very little evidence that this is the case. So um, that, that's another example of an interaction where, you know, um, the interaction is unimportant, although the main effect is extremely important. So basically what I'm saying is I expect to see differences in the average value from center to center, but the response to treatment, if you find a good scale, less so. Thanks for the questions, Teresa, and thanks for the discussion, Stephen. Um, any last questions? If not, we might let Stephen get on with his day and we might let the rest of you go and have your dinner. Okay. Um, please join me virtually in thanking Stephen very much for two great lectures. And just to remind you all, the next um, part of this webinar series, so lectures three and four, will be in two weeks' time um, at the same time. So please join us then. Thanks again, Stephen, and um, have a lovely day. There's lots of thank yous going on. Okay, in thanks, Kate. Good luck, everybody. Bye. Bye, thanks, everyone. Stephen.